Lately, I've had a lot of requests to cover a Dario Argento film on the channel. The obvious choice at first would be Suspiria, being probably his most legendary film, a film that's inspired the visual look of my videos. And for that matter, I had also considered covering the follow-up to Suspiria, Inferno, which is a movie that I also love, one that I've recommended in the past in my Shudder promotions. But ultimately, I was in the mood to go back to a film that might be one of his more underappreciated films. A film that serves as a bit of meta-commentary on Argento's career, as well as just being one of his most brutal, finely crafted films. So for today's episode of Oops All Kills, let's take a look at 1987's Opera. This video was sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is my favorite streaming service, it's basically the Netflix of horror. This month, I'm going to recommend Stage Fright, a film very similar to opera directed by Michele Suave, who appears as an actor in this movie and was produced by Joe D'Amato, creator of Anthropophagus. We're currently in the middle of Shudder's 61 Days of Halloween, full of new movies and series like a new season of Creepshow, VHS 94, new specials from Elvira and Joe Bob Briggs, a new season of the Boulay Brothers, Dragula, and their new docuseries, Behind the Monsters. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Vicious Fun, The Mortuary Collection, and PG, Psycho Goreman, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit creep show TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder for 30 days, just go to shudder.com and use code WANG. Dario Argento's opera tells the story of a troubled production of Macbeth. A fitting stage production to be taking place inside of an Argento film, considering that Macbeth is known to be one of the unluckiest, most cursed productions ever known. Just centuries of unfortunate mishaps and death. In this film, Verdi's Macbeth opera is being interpreted by a horror movie director turned stage director, a man named Marco, played by actor Ian Charlson. And if a horror movie about a horror movie director turned stage director makes you think, hmm, Maybe Argento is putting just a little bit of himself in the story, you'd probably be right. You see, prior to this movie, Argento had actually been working on his own stage production of Macbeth. A version of Macbeth that takes place in World War I and incorporates many of Argento's horror sensibilities. Ultimately though, his producers backed out when they didn't see eye to eye on the final vision. The whole thing wound up being shelved, leading to the production of this film, Opera. A film that Argento itself would come to believe is as cursed as many live productions of Macbeth, with several tragedies of its own occurring during production, the greatest of which occurring to Ian Charleston, the actor who was tasked with playing the film version of Argento. You see, during production, Charleston was involved in a car accident. Although he survived the accident, the resulting medical procedures would lead to his diagnosis with AIDS, which would ultimately take his life in 1990. But despite the curse surrounding Macbeth, you might be surprised to see that Opera is one of Argento's least supernatural films, one of the ones that's the most grounded in reality. And this leads to some of the most visceral kills that he's ever produced. So without further ado, let's get into these kills. The film begins with an argument between the star of the opera, Mara Chakova, arguing with the director about the live ravens he's using in the production. This isn't one of his kooky little horror movies, this is the theater, and Mara Shakova has had enough. Luckily for the production though, in the only shot in the film that we ever actually see Mara Shakova, she just flops right in front of a car. Can't do the opera no more. Now, only her reluctant understudy, Betty, could save the day. But Betty fears the production's curse. And she also worries that she's too young to play the role of Lady Macbeth. But after some reassurance from her agent, the director, and the rest of the crew, she decides that she's going to do it. Ironically, despite her humble characterization in contrast with Mara Chakova, Argento has since claimed that Betty's actress, Christina Marsalak, was the most difficult actress they had ever worked with. In any case, what is very clearly a horror movie director's interpretation of Macbeth ensues. You have floating skulls, crashed planes, and handguns, you know, just normal Shakespeare stuff. And sure enough, disaster strikes very shortly into Betty's first performance as Lady Macbeth. As a mystery man in Jimmy McMillan gloves watches her from the rafters, 
He's caught by a stagehand who gets in a tussle with him, knocking down some stage lights and stopping the production in the process. The gloved man impales the stagehand on the world's most penis-like coat hook I've ever seen. Just look at the glands on that motherfucker. Take that shit long and hard, Paul Revere. These are just some shitty stage lights. No reason to stop the whole production. The show must go on. And so it does, without any further incidents, and to great acclaim. This little girl seemed to love it, and just listen to how much this is very clearly a little, an actual little girl doing a little girl voice, and it's definitely not overdubbed by an adult doing a, a child voice. Just listen. Well done, Betty. You're so beautiful. She loves it. Betty even gets a flower from an admirer. Look at this stud. A man so awkward that she thinks he's a foreigner. But you know, good thing for him, he looks like the dreamy date from the Dream Phone board game, so you know, he's got that going for him. Oh yeah, and also he's a cop. Inspector Santini, at your service. That might come in handy at this opera house that's full of death. Afterwards, Betty's boyfriend slash stage manager Stefan comes to inform her that her dress needs some alterations. And also, he's gotta tell her one of the stagehands died. Something he describes as being pretty weird. One of the stagehands died. What? Yeah, it's pretty weird. Which, I mean, I guess he's technically correct. It is pretty weird to fucking see a stagehand get impaled on a penis coat hook. But he quickly forgets about all that and asks her for a kiss. And she gives it to him. Good thing she didn't care that much about that stagehand dying or he would have had one of those, you know, uh, uh, gotta cringe staircase scenarios. After the kiss, Lurch brings a gift from Mara Chakova, a bottle of stinky liquor. However, these two are nailed to the X, so they pour it down the drain and, oh my god, it's poison. Mara Chakova is the killer. No, wait, no, Stefano's just doing a goof. St this Stefano guy is definitely gonna live a long, fulfilling life, I can tell. We cut to the killer having a Jimmy Neutron-style brain blast as he reminisces about some boobs he touched back in the day. We then see his toolkit full of ropes, blades, and needles. Tools that he uses to damage the dress, setting up a sequence of events that he'll later capitalize on. But for now, he just frees the crows and kills some of them for the giggles. And as their crow buddies go for revenge, he makes his escape. And this is another case of the fiction of this film bleeding into reality, as it turns out that of the 140 crows used for this movie, only 60 of them were ever actually found. 80 of them just escaped and went completely missing. But anyway, it's time now for little Johnny Livalot Stefano to not live so much no more. It starts when Stefano and Betty have some unsatisfying sex. They don't really get into any of the details, Betty just says, Oh, I'm a disaster in bed. Dry pussy have an ass bitch. <laughs> Damn it, Betty, you dry pussy have an ass bitch. Stefano decides he's gonna get some tea to help get things moving a little bit, and while Stefano's gone, Betty gets captured. Jimmy McMillan glove right over her mouth, tied and bound with some rope, and a final piece, the most iconic instrument used in this film. A row of needles attached to tape placed underneath the eyes so she can't blink. What she's about to witness, she has to see the whole thing. And note that this little device came from a joke that Argento had made in the past. He had said that this was what he would like to do to people who watch his films and cover their eyes during the gory scenes. Anyway, when these parts play out, I like to play a little game, although it's something that you'll probably do instinctually without even me having to tell you what it is. I challenge you to watch these death scenes without blinking. Because, you know, if you were in Betty's position and you were to blink, you'd rip up your entire island. Are you up to the challenge? Stefano returns, confused about what's going on, and just as he's inches away from Betty, knife right under his jaw, which penetrates into his mouth, but it's not over yet. With some heavy metal playing in the background, no escape by Norton Lights, the killer stabs Stefano sloppily and repeatedly all over the place, even through his hands as he tries to protect himself, which is one of the most brutal things about this movie. You know, you, you kill someone in real life, it's not like, it's like, oh, I stabbed you and you're dead. It's a fucking struggle. These people all fight for their lives, and it just makes it feel so much more real and brutal. But ultimately, Stefano doesn't make it, and the killer leaves Betty with some reinsurance before setting her free. It's not true, you fidget. Not a bitch on heat. After watching her lover be brutally stabbed to death, Betty runs aimlessly through the streets in the pouring rain where she encounters Marco, who gives her a ride. 
during which they don't really talk about how Betty just saw a guy get stabbed to death brutally and repeatedly with needles taped to her eyes so she can't not look. Instead, they have a conversation about love and filmmaking. Eventually, though, they do get to the kill stuff when they get back to her place. Not only that, she mentions that she believes she's seen this masked killer in her dreams before. Meanwhile, the costume designer, Julia, is tasked with repairing the now-damaged dress. Huh, wonder how she's gonna die. Jimmy Neutron has another brain blast, and it's killing time. Betty once again gets the glove, she's tied, she's needle-taped, and it's that time again, don't blink. Julia, who had been investigating a strange piece of jewelry that was attached to the dress, gives some chase to the killer, believe it or not. That is, until he hits her in the ass with an iron. Like, he throws the iron and it just smacks her cheeks. The killer was like, hey Julia, that ass is too juicy, we gotta flatten it out a bit. But even still, with a flattened ass, Julia remains feisty and melees him in the back of the head with the iron. And she takes the jewelry back from him. While the killer appears unconscious, Julia decides to unmask him, and you will not believe who this is. Uh, come on, you thought we were gonna find out that easy? The Jimmy McMillan gloves come up and choke her to once again the heavy metal soundtrack, Northern Lights No Escape. And as Julia gets stabbed to death in the chest with the scissors, she has one final act of defiance. She swallows the bracelet so the killer can't have it, which of course just means that the killer's gotta get it out of her somehow. It's already in too deep to get it out of her mouth, so of course, he has to dig it out of her esophagus with a scissor as Betty has no choice but to watch. Finally, he warns Betty that he can take her, whenever and wherever he wants. And he slowly guides the scissor down her body and frees her. It's a horrifying moment, yet at the same time it's one that undoubtedly unlocks some deep-seated fetish in many of the women watching this. Maybe even you. Betty finds the dapper but awkward police inspector and tells him everything that happened. So he has her wait for his assistant, Danielle Suave. It's worth noting that the character Daniele Suave is portrayed by the director Michele Suave, Dario Argento's longtime associate, who would direct a very similar film of his own, Stage Fright, as well as one of my favorite all time films, Della Morte Della More, aka Cemetery Man. As Suave is investigating, Betty's agent Mira comes over to her apartment and mentions that the police are keeping an eye on her. How does Mira know this? Well, you see, the policeman downstairs told her. A policeman named Daniele Suave. Meaning that the Daniele Suave that's currently in Betty's apartment investigating is not Daniele Suave at all. So the women arm themselves knowing that it's most likely the killer that's in this apartment right now. They wait for him, standing in that trademark colorful Argento lighting. When there's someone at the door, who also claims to be a cop. Mira, who does not believe him, presses her face right up against the peephole to look. So, in a movie like this, what do you think is gonna happen when a person pushes their eye right up against the peephole? You probably guessed right, in an attempt to prove that he is in fact a policeman. He does a little magic trick. Now Mira is the one having a brain blast. Reportedly, this was a really scary effect to shoot, because it entailed mounting explosives to the back of the actress's head. And on top of that, oh yeah, she had divorced Dario Argento two years before this movie was made, so you know, you never really know. Enough is enough. I'll kill you! Betty is ready to fight back. With a big-ass knife, the mystery man in the apartment does not stand a chance. So she turns the corner, and there he is. And somebody already beat her to stabbing him in the belly. As it turns out, this dead man is the real Daniele Suave, who has now ceased to be. Betty takes Suave's gun and attempts to shoot the masked man, who's now standing over her. But unfortunately, Betty has that G.I. Joe aim. Of course, it was never going to be that easy. Marco has a plan. You see, crows are very smart animals. I've often thought of ways myself to befriend local crows. You know, you put out some treats for them. I actually, I got a crow call that I forgot to bring on tour with me. Although, to be honest, I don't really know how feasible all that is. But regardless, crows are smart animals, and they do remember you. And these crows saw the person who killed their crow friends. So, if the killer is in the audience, 
and you let them loose, they're going to go after the killer. So in the middle of the performance, Marco sends out the entire cage of crows with their trainer, and the crows just kind of sit there staring into space with their beaks open. Room the show for nothing, but then wait a minute, something actually does catch their attention. Wouldn't you know it, it's the fucking police inspector. The crows have decided to peck his eyes out, meaning that he must be the killer. And of course, you know, crows, they're not gonna let good food go to waste. You gotta gobble up that whole eyeball. But there's no time to celebrate, yet. The inspector, who pistol lips poor Marco, is already waiting for Betty in her dressing room. And he reveals that he used to kill at the behest of Betty's own mother who he would also kill when she became too demanding. You see, throughout this film, we see glimpses of Betty's dreams, where she watches as this woman is killed. And it turns out that this was no dream at all. Rather, it was Betty's repressed memory of watching her mother get killed by this man. And after having seen Betty perform, he believes she's just like her mother, and his almonds are now reactivated. Once again, he must go on a wild killing spree. And as he tells this story, he's just so involved in it that he doesn't really even seem to care that he has a bloody hole where his eye used to be. And thus, it's time for his final act. Dousing the entire room in gasoline so they can burn to death together. The inspector then puts a gun in Betty's hand and urges her to shoot him. She's hesitant, especially because she's blindfolded and it's kind of hard to aim. But eventually she does, setting the entire gassed up room ablaze. Betty manages to free herself, and along with the rest of the crew, she watches Santini burn to death. Jump to one of the strangest shifts I've ever seen in a movie. Betty and Marco have escaped all the craziness and gone off to the scenic Swiss countryside. Betty is just out there enjoying nature when all of a sudden a news broadcast comes on. See, as it turns out, Santini had simply just burned a fake mannequin. He's still out there, and he's close as indicated by Marco's maid being dead in the other room with a knife shoved in her. We now have metal blasting in the Swiss Alps, and you know what that means, it's time for a chase. Santini chases Betty through a field until Marco manages to get in there and tackle the inspector. But his jujitsu's bad, so he winds up at the bottom of the grapple, getting his nice white sweater all bloody and stabbed, leading to probably the most peculiar moment in the entire film. Betty admits her feelings for Santini and says that he's right, she is just like her mother, and they have to escape together before they find the body. Here's what's really interesting about this scene. I've noticed that a lot of people when watching this at first don't realize that she's very obviously trying to trick him. It's probably in part due to her delivery, and also because it's the end of the movie and sometimes these movies will have a quirky twist like that. But in fact, at one point, this was being considered as a possible alternate ending. An ending where she really does fall in love with Santini and run off with him. That wound up not being the case, though. Instead, she beats his ass when he's not looking and then the cops get him. And the movie ends with Betty giving a monologue about how she's so different from the other girls because she likes flowers and insects and clouds. Definitely one of Argento's strangest endings ever. So strange, in fact, that the American distributor of this film demanded that he remove the entire Swiss Alps scene. Obviously, though, he just said fuck that and they kept it. Ultimately, though, Opera is one of my favorite films by Dario Argento. It's one that, perhaps more so than a lot of the others, all the kills feel very purposeful and realistic. And the way that the aesthetic elements of the opera and the film itself are woven together make it perhaps one of the most appealing works of his artistically. And ultimately, Argento's lost take on Macbeth did wind up seeing the light of day, with live performances between 2013 and 2014. Shakespeare and Blood Spray, together at last. Anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, check out my other video about this viral plastic surgery hoax. I'm out.